We're back again, guys. The G1 Climax keeps on running on in the summer of 2023. Welcome back to the Rant and Review Pro Wrestling. We are covering the G1 Climax all the nights, going all the way through to the playoffs and to the finals. It's uh, It's been an interesting tournament so far. We're getting to the middle part of the tournament, and things are starting to get con- the consequences of losing and winning and having draws are about to show up because we got some guys that might very soon be out of contention for the tournament. And again, this is, if you're new to the G1, this is part of the cycle. It's like the first week you get to see some cool matches, get to kind of get the lay of the lay of things. And then when you get to about this point in the G1, then things start getting really serious because you start seeing some guys get desperate because if they lose one more match, they might be done, but we're going to get into that in this video. Before we get into that, though, I want to remind you guys, of course, YouTube, algorithms, like buttons, subscribe buttons, notification bells, all of those things. If you want to give an Oz cutter to that like button, I definitely would appreciate it. Just go ahead. Actually, you know what? Give a hidden blade to it. Just rear that elbow back and just. Yeah, right to that like button. And if you do so, if you do so. If this video gets at least 100 likes, what I will do is provide a very nice picture for you guys on the next G1 recap. So get this video to 100 likes. I will actually post up a, a picture that I'm sure most of you guys out there in particular will, <laughs> will like to see. But anyway, that stuff aside, let's talk about the G1 Climax so far. So we are now into the middle part of the tournament. And on night seven, we were back at Cork and Hall. Now, yes, as I said the other day, night six was not very good. <laughs> it's just, that's a, that's honestly, night six sucked. But night seven, we were back at court again, so we had a good crowd, and we had some great matches on this on this first night with the A block and the B block continuing. And we start out right from the shoot with Will Ospreay against the great Ocon, an intra-faction match here for the United Empire. And it was very clear as this match went on what the purpose of this match for Osprey was. Osprey was going to try to put over his fellow faction mate, which he should, the Great Ocon. He made Great Ocon look like a million bucks. Great Ocon pulled out a couple new moves in this match, but Great Ocon is in a very bad position. I talked earlier about guys who were about to be on the cusp of being eliminated from any chance of going to the playoffs, and Great Ocon is one of those guys. He really, really desperately needed this win over Will Osprey. He didn't get it. But it was a fantastically fun match, and the crowd was eating this up. Uh, Osprey wins over his uh, his stablemate. They, you know, he's kind of smiling at Great O'Con, who's clawing at him at the end of the match. And they kind of, you know, they shake hands and do the uh, well, how I don't know how the they're it's like a two I don't know whatever the United the United Empire this one yeah the <laughs> the United Empire symbol. Uh, and that was good. So Osprey goes on. He's continuing to, of course, try to stay. <laughs> he's got to win these matches if he's going to have any chance of catching up with Okada. Uh, of course, their match is coming up this week. That is a huge match for the B block. Uh, Osprey and Okada coming up, and we will be reviewing it on our next video, catching up with the G1. Gabe Kidd took on Shota Umino. Of course, Shota Umino, is, for those of you who know, or don't know, uh, he does the Moxie entrance, but they do it a little bit more in New Japan where they film him from where he starts and then coming to the ring and coming to the arena. So there's a very, very I haven't been, I've never been to Cork and Hall. It's on my bucket list of things to do as a wrestling fan. I want to go to a show at Cork and Hall. But apparently there's this like hallway in Cork and Hall where all of the legends have signed the walls. And that's where Shota was meditating before the match started. He walks up through that, goes through the mezzanine, goes into the arena like he does. That was a cool shot. But out of nowhere, we know that Shota does his entrances. And we also know that Gabriel Kidd likes to ambush people. And sure enough, <laughs> when Shota came out into Cork and Hall, here comes Gabe Kidd from out of nowhere, blindsided <laughs> Shota Umino, takes his jacket, puts it on, starts mocking him. And this match... This is a great, I, I want to see these, I hope these two have a proper rivalry in like a year or so from now, because I think there's some magic to be had with these two guys. Uh, Gabe Kidd talking a lot of smack. He took one fan's like little sign of fans who had like kids and ripped the sign from them for Shota, choked Shota with it, and then started doing the, the taint rub that you do out of the shower, well, some of you may do, some of you might not. Uh, <laughs> Out of, out of the shower with a towel with the thing and then threw it back to the fans 
And that kind of pissed Shota off. Shota started coming back because Gabe Kidd was beating the crap out of him for the majority of this match. But Shota came back. He was able to finally score the win on Gabe Kidd. This is, these first two matches are better than anything you saw on, the night, on night six, by the way. Uh, these first two matches set the tone for the night. I was like, all right, we're in for a good night of New Japan action. Shota Umino getting the points. Uh, finally getting a win in this tournament. He's been without one. And uh, that would be a theme for the night for the uh, Rayo uh, Three Musketeers. Is that, well, for some of them. <laughs> some, some not so much. But some of these young guys who've been in these draws and have been losing matches to Sonata, this was an opportunity for them to kind of come back and show that did it in his match with Gabe Kidd. And a match I can't believe was this early on a card. Tai Chi was going up against Kenta. And when I saw the graphic come on the screen, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be great. Tai Chi, great kicker. Kenta, known for his kicks. This is going to be a kick fest. Not so, <laughs> not so much. This match lasted two minutes. Kenta beat Tai Chi in two minutes. Like um, two minutes and 11 seconds or something. One of the shortest matches. Not the shortest match, but it's one of the shortest matches in the tournament. And Kenta just cheating his ass off. He grabbed his his DeFi title belt when the referee was down. Of course, the referees go. The referees in New Japan, y'all got to build up some muscle or something. Y'all getting knocked around every single match in this tournament. Even Kevin Kelly said it's a little bit too much. But the referee was knocked out, of course. So uh, Taichi goes to go give a kick. And Kenta takes the belt and slams it into Taichi's leg, hurting Taichi. So this is a kayfabe injury. So look for this to, to play out. Again, I always say in, this, in the G1, these things kind of play out. So then Taichi's next match, that leg injury from getting hit by Kenta with the belt might tie into what happens in Tai Chi's next match. But Kenta was able to get the win, a very cheap win here from Kenta, but he did get the win. Uh, next matchup was Yoda Suji against Chase Owens. Uh, Chase really, really wanting to, to stay in contention, really, really wanting to keep his momentum. Again, for Chase, he's not really looking at any of these young guys in the A block. He's looking at Sonata. So Chase, and Chase has been doing great in this tournament. And I've been saying this for and everybody who watches Chase Owens. I know a lot of people, and I see it in the comments, you guys hate on Chase Owens, hate on Chase Owens. Chase Owens is a damn good wrestler. Some of the stuff he was doing in this match is some of the counters he was given to, to Yoda Suji. And, like, they had this one exchange where Suji was trying to get into the ring, and Chase would go after him, and Suji would go this way, and then he would try to catch. But then Chase would get out the way, and then Chase would come back, and then Suji would get out the way, and then Suji would try. And they, they did this thing. Like, there's, like, five or six sequences there where they just kept missing each other, and Chase finally got the hit. It looked like Chase Owens was on his way to a route in this match, but he didn't. Yoda Suji finally getting on the board, getting a big win over Chase Owens, a much-needed win for him in this tournament. Next up was Tonga Loa. He's taking on El Fantasmo, two guys who got kicked out of Bullet Club last year, meeting up in this match. And again, remember El Fantasmo, uh, who I, I did see a comment, and I haven't verified this yet. Somebody did say that ELP's dad passed away recently. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So if you guys know about that, uh, put it in the comment box below. I'm going to check it out afterwards. If it is, and ELP watches this video, you know, my condolences uh, to you and your family, if that's true. This match with Tongaloa. Uh, Tongaloa is in Hontai, but El Fantasmo, he's still not in a faction yet. He's still looking for a faction to be a part of. But they had a match. They, they had a good, it was a good match. It wasn't the best match. Uh, but Tongaloa, I've noticed the last two matches, he's been looking a lot better. Every single match he's having, it's like the ring rust is getting knocked off. And he is looking great in a lot of the, the last two matches he's been looking really good in. And ELP is ELP. He's He's got so much athletic ability. It's just amazing. Uh, but he's he kind of was looking past Loa a little bit. And even when the match was over, he didn't win the match against Tonga Loa. They kind of, you know, shook hands and were friendly about it afterwards. But he went out to Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton and talked about how he's going after Kenta big time. So that that big match is on the horizon. Uh, ELP wants Kenta for really badly. But they're not even – I mean, it's not going to happen in this tournament because they're not in the same block. But I don't know. Something's going to happen with that in the future, I guess, for the DeFi Championship. Renarita took on Hikaleo. Now, this is one where I'd said, you know, for some of these young guys, it was a night for them to get a win. For some of them, they're still looking. And these two poor guys, Hikaleo sitting at zero, Renarita at two points, but Renarita hasn't won a match. He just had two draws, and he hasn't won anything else. So the problem for him is, it's like he's got to win a match. I love that Chris Charlton kind of explained this too. And this is one of the cool things about the 20 minute time limits this year is he did explain that because Ren Narita has two draws, even if Ren Narita say ends up with six points, 
and Gabriel Kidd w- ends up with six points, even though they had the same amount of points. If Gabe Kidd got those points from winning three matches, he would beat Ren Narita in a tiebreaker because he's be- had more wins than Ren Narita did. So that's how the tiebreakers work. That's one of them. <laughs> we'll get into that in, in the final week because the tiebreakers in this tournament can be kind of confusing. But as far as this match, Ren Narita was trying, and they brought it up, Ren Narita's trying to just beat up Hikaleu Hikaleu is like a damn near foot taller than Ren Narita. It's not working. And Hikaleu kind of finding out again that he's a giant. Uh, he's still wrestling. Even the commentary, is, the commentary brought this up. He's still wrestling not like a giant, and he should be. He did do some of that in this match. Uh, Ren Narita did score some good moves on Hikaleu, but at the end of the day, it was Hikaleu who got the win with the choke slam. Hikaleu finally on the board. Um, might be a too little too late. We'll see. Um, because that A block, Sonata and Kiyomiya might be running away with this thing, but they would decide that later in the night. By the way, I also want to apologize. Um, in the last video, I said Hikaleu, I referenced Hikaleu when I met Hanari uh, a couple times. Hanari has been a lights out in this tournament, and I did not give him credit for that. So I just want to go back and make that correction. We get into the semi main event of the night. It was a match I wasn't looking forward to, but it was Yoshihashi versus Kazuchika Okada. But damn, was I <laughs> proven wrong. Yoshihashi showing up. Oh my God, Yoshihashi fought his butt. And you know, again, much like the Osprey match of Okan, this is another intra-faction warfare where the leader of the faction is against one of the subordinates. Uh, Okada, of course, the leader of chaos. Yoshihashi always been a subordinate. But for those of you who are new to New Japan, This goes back to Okada's debut in New Japan after he came back from excursion. The first match he had was against Yoshihashi, who is his peer. They're contemporaries. They were young lions together, and they were seen to be equals when Okada came back. They had a kind of a stinker match (laughs) at that that, uh, Wrestle Kingdom, and that was the same Wrestle Kingdom where at the end of the show, Okada challenged Tanahashi, and that led to Okada surprising everybody with the Rainmaker shock and winning the, the championship as a um, guy coming back from excursion. But this is many years later, and Yoshihashi has gotten a lot better. Okada, again, we've, we've, we've proven the case. If you punch Okada or kick him in the face really hard, he will try. And y- Yoshihashi did that. And Okada kind of looked like he was he was a little off a step here and there. And Yoshihashi was handing him his ass after this match. Uh, but the problem you saw... And I love the way that they played this. And this was obviously intentional by them setting this match up. Yoshihashi would hit a big move. He would counter Okada, beat Okada to the punch, hit a big move, but then he would stand and stare and take the adulation from the crowd. And even the crowd is going, no, go get the win. And he's doing this stuff and missing opportunities to get the win over Okada. He And kayfabe wise, he could have probably beaten Okada if he wasn't doing that stuff. But Okada, being the savvy veteran that he is now, even though he's pretty much the same age as Yoshihashi, he's just better. And he took advantage. And after trying so many times to hit the Rainmaker, he finally was able to get the Rainmaker, gets the win on Yoshihashi. And Okada has now really elevated himself. He's at eight points now. And uh, the B-Block guys, there's some guys in the B-Block um we'll get to this when we get to the standings but there's a couple guys who are they're not eliminated yet technically they're like this go one more win from okada and some of these guys there's a couple guys in the, in the b block that are going to be done sonata the big one sonata versus kiyomiya sonata leading the block with six points kiyomiya with five points of course sonata the current reigning iwgp world heavyweight champion who has experienced a lot of what Kiyomiya is experiencing over in Pro Wrestling Noah and Kiyomiya coming in for Pro Wrestling Noah to the G1. Um, I love the fact that Chris Charlton and, again, Kevin Kelly, they did a bang-up job, by the way, on English commentary this night with giving you a lot of the backstory, a lot of the context, and a lot of flavor for these matches. They, I don't think they get enough credit for that, uh, especially Chris Charlton. Chris Charlton's such good insight. And Kevin Kelly, when he's being serious, he is one of the best play-by-play guys in the business. This match, they, sh- they shine... Sonata shine, Kiyomiya shine. They had a sequence where both of them were kind of going for the Shining Wizards because they're both disciples of Keiji Muto. And like Sonata did this like backflip out of something and Kiyomiya went to go for the Shining Wizard and like Sonata ducked out of the way. Then Sonata tried to come back and Kiyomiya blocked it and they did the standoff. The crowd was starting going nuts for this. Now the crowd, of course, because 
we love the underdogs. They were cheering it off of Kiyomiya, but they respected Sonata. And this match, <laughs> they get to five minutes left, four minutes left. Kiyomiya is trying to pin Sonata. Sonata is trying to pin Kiyomiya. They can't get it. Three minutes left. They keep trying. Can't get the pin. Two minutes. One minute. 30 seconds left. I'm like, this match is... And what I thought was going to happen, too, is like, this match is going to go to a draw. Two seconds left. And kind of a little confusion going for the pin. With two seconds left. Sonata beat Kiyomiya with two seconds left on the clock. That was fantastic. That is one of the coolest endings I've seen in the G1 this year. Carlton pointed out, I, I was kind of debating this. I was like, I could see this match being a draw, but that's kind of bad for Sonata. And Chris Charlton did bring this up, that Sonata is the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. And anything short of a victory of him beating Kiyomiya, he can't lose, definitely, and he can't draw. He has to beat Kiyomiya or his championship reign is kind of in the dumps. And they've talked, they talked about it like, Sonata, since he won the title, he hasn't defended against Will Ospreay. He hasn't defended against Naito. He hasn't defended even against Tanahashi, who's even in a decline. He hasn't defended against anybody, any of the heavy hitters in New Japan. Not Shingo, none of these guys. He defended against Hiromu. Hiromu's great, but he's a junior heavyweight. Jungle Boy Jack Perry, of course, at Forbidden Door, who, you know is not main event level in New Japan or AEW. He didn't know anything about New Japan anyway. And uh, the other match was against a returning young lion in Yoda Suji. So Sonata has not had t a really tough defenses for his IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. This is probably the biggest challenge he's had since he's been champion. And he, he passed it with two seconds left, but he, he, he eked it out. But a couple years ago, the last time there was a pro wrestling Nova guy was when Marafuji came into the first G1 that was available on New Japan World. Uh, the one I always talk about, one of my favorite uh, G1s was uh, G1 Climax 26. And uh, Marafuji was in there and he faced Okada and beat Okada in the G1 tournament, which led to a match that October. Kevin Kelly brought this up again. If Kiyomiya won this match against Sonata, that probably would be the main event at the uh, King of Pro Wrestling pay-per-view, which would be Sonata would have to probably defend against Kiyomiya. I think that might still happen. Because, again, this match was very, very close. I don't know if Kiyomi is coming back again to New Japan anytime soon. Uh, I do think eventually there's going to be, whether if it doesn't happen in this tournament, there's going to be another match with Kiyomiya and Okada. And I think Kiyomi is more geared towards that than worrying about uh, Sonata and trying to be IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. But this was an excellent match. The whole night was great. The only match that I didn't think was really, I would say, is you could probably skip would be Renarita and Hikaleu. No disrespect to them, but... The, it was just that the other, all the other matches on this card were so either really fun or really intense. And like I said, the finish with Sonata and Kiyomiya was great. Gabe Kidd and Shota Umino was great. Great Okan and Will Osprey was great. Oh, uh, Yoshihashi and, and Yoshihashi. I cannot believe I'm saying this on his channel. Yoshihashi had a great match with Kazuchika Okada, one that you definitely need to watch. In fact, just watch this whole night. <laughs> This is this night night seven is great. Now here's the question: We're about to go now review night eight, which is the C block and D block. And the question coming up right now: Are the A block and the B block really really good, and the C block and the D block really not as great? Uh, that seems to be the case because, as I said uh, a couple nights ago, when it was the, a, the last time A block and B block came together, that cart was fantastic. That night was fantastic. The matches were great, and then we got the C and D block the next night. It was kind of meh. So we'll see. They're at Corrigan Hall. They're going to have a crowd. They're going to have a hot Tokyo crowd. Uh, they've got some big marquee matches coming up uh, for the next night. You know, I said I had to worry about the uh, <laughs> C and B and C and D block on the next night. Well, it turned out I didn't really have to worry that much. This on night eight was a tremendous step up from night seven with the C and the D block and the G1 climax. Then we started off with Evil versus Hanare. I did kind of think Hanari was going to win this match. I was a little surprised that they had Evil win it. But again, and I've been saying it's all tournament. These are some of the best performances I've seen from Hanari uh, since I've been watching him in New Japan. So um, hats off to him. He's he's done an amazing job uh, in the G1 this year. Uh, and up next is Alex Coglin and Hiroki Goto. This match did not go very long. Alex Coglin, who, I, as I've said, he's more concerned with beating people up than getting wins but this time he made sure he got the win because 
uh, Hiroki Goto being one half of the World Tag Team Champions, uh, Coglin being one half of the War Dogs Heavyweight Tag Teams, who are now the NJPW Strong Tag Team Champions. They got those from Goto and Yoshihashi. So this, with this pin, it is very likely that we're going to get a rematch, and Coglin and Gabe Kidd might be going for the IWGP Heavyweight Championships again and might win them next time so we're gonna have to keep an eye on that but Coglin finally gets on the board i have been very concerned about mikey nichols in this match he was stumbling around too i don't know if he was con i don't know what's going on i am noticing that he's having some issues uh performance wise in the ring he's, he's missing some spots and doing it's, it's i don't know what's up with that uh but it, uh, i am noticing it so i don't know if anybody else is noticing it but uh, shingo did manage to get the win here it looks like they called an auto at the end of the match because uh, he, Nichols might be hurt. I don't know. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi took on Toru Yano. This is a another classic Yano comedy match. Not the greatest, not the worst. It was okay. Uh, Tanahashi though does win this match, getting some rare points. Neither one of these guys are probably going to be in the playoff. Tanahashi did the high fly flow, which those knees, man. You keep messing with the knees. I don't know. But then we had one of the oh my god, Eddie Kingston. Tomohiro Ishii, we've seen them battle before. This again now in the G1 Climax. And oh, <laughs> boy, this was, as, as some bald guy on the internet says, big men slapping meat. Um, Ishii and Kingston are just literally beating the crap out of each other this entire match. And Kingston is in this match. He's got a bad back. He, it's like legitimately his back is kind of mess, messing with him. And it seems to be a problem with him for the first half of the match. And then he starts taking some bumps on it. And then maybe it just kicked in. But at near the end of the match, he powered up. He powered out. He powered up. But it was Tomohiro Ishii finally getting a win in the G1 Climax. Uh, getting a win over Eddie Kingston. That's pretty cool. So he's two points on the board. Um, like I said, a great match. I definitely suggest you guys go out and check that one out. In the shocker of this whole thing. Shane Hayes takes on Tetsuya Naito, and LIJ fans, I'm sure, are furious. Shane Hayes does get the win over Tetsuya Naito. Naito had said before in the Japanese press, why was somebody like Shane Hayes in the G1 Climax? He doesn't deserve to be in here. Shane Hayes obviously taking exception to that. He put Naito to, through his paces and uh, got the win on the leader of LIJ and uh, Naito not looking good so far in a G1 this year. He in both, both he and Haste are at four points. The semi main event was Tama Tonga and David Finley renewing their rivalry. Uh, now, given what had happened before, I was completely confident that Tama Tonga was going to win this match. Finley dominated. He didn't completely dominate Tama Tonga like he did in their match earlier this year when he took the never open weight title from Tama Tonga. But he did have a he did have a lot of control near the end of this match, and it looked like at some points he was going to win. There's some crazy spots in this thing, but Tama Tonga was able to roll up Finley, be able to get the pin, but immediately afterwards got a Shaley. So there again, it's the first pin that Finley's taken in a long time since the uh, New Japan Cup. So you know they they're trying to protect him again. They're trying to, they have to do everything they can to keep Finley looking strong. So even if, though he has to lose this match, he's going to lose it, but stand tall at the end. And they even played his music going out. So again, New Japan being very, very protective of David Finley and rightfully so. If they want to get him over as the new leader of Bull Club, he's got to be protected to some extent. In the main event on this night, it was one of my low key favorite series of this year. I've talked about this before. I love this series earlier in the spring, but Jeff Cobb, Zach Sabre Jr. Uh, this is for the leadership in the block right now. Both of these guys tied. And uh, I love the combination. I've talked about this before. I think Jeff Cobb being this power wrestler who improvises and has these kind of unique variations on moves against Zach Sabre Jr. Who's a very uh, unorthodox technical wrestler. The two of the, this clashing of styles, and as they say, styles make matches, really works well together. These two did some really cool stuff in this match. Um, I, I definitely suggest you checking this one out. Uh, Zach is is great. Uh, Cobb is great. Uh, in the end, though, for the first time, uh, I think it's the first time recently in the rivalry. I think he may have had one win before, but Jeff Cobb finally picks up the win over Zack Sabre Jr. here. Cobb now looking extremely strong in the block, and we'll see where 
this leads him in the future. Um, I still think Zach is still a contender to make the playoffs at least. I just don't know right now. It, you know, that block, that D block is very, very difficult to kind of pick. But as some of the old favorites are kind of fading away here, it might be time for these two guys to take their place in that upper echelon in the New Japan roster. So they were on night nine and, and Oda City, I think everybody just lost their mind. Of course, this venue is kind of the birthplace of New Japan pro wrestling anyway. So it's always kind of a special show when they go here. But right out the bat, we got the A block, Shota Umino and Chase Owens. This match was way more intense than I thought it was going to be. Uh, Shota really needing a win here. He does get the win with the Death Rider. And all of a sudden now, Shota Umino, he's rising up there a little bit in the rankings uh, in the G1 Climax. It didn't look like uh, any of the Rayoa Three Musketeers had much of a chance to kind of make the playoffs the way they've all been kind of middling throughout this tournament for the first two weeks. But uh, Shota is now finding himself somewhat in contention, a possibility that he could at least be a runner-up in the block. We also had Yoshihashi versus Taichi. Taichi clowning Yoshihashi a lot. As everybody in this tournament has clowned Yoshihashi most of the nights except for Okada. Hey, it was the Black Mephisto. Taichi got the win. These two always have a these two always have fun matches against each other. I know some people might this might not be like a marquee match that pops out of people or something like, ooh, I gotta see that, but their matches are fun. I would suggest checking it out uh if you want to watch this whole card. Then all hell just starts breaking loose on this. I don't know what they got in the water over there, but something was in the water. Something was going on in the back. They were smoking something. I don't know what the rest of the roster thought here. But match three, Kaito Kiyomiya versus Gabe Kidd. I have not seen this level of just animosity and, and hatred between two wrestlers. These guys, were, well, first, Gabe Kidd, of course, always jumps people before they come out to the ring. So he beats the living tar out of Kiyomiya. Kiyomiya finally makes his comeback in the match. They're going outside the ring. They're throwing each other in the fans. They're walking, Gabe Kidd in particular, walking some very dangerous lines, getting close to hurting some people in the audience. Um, just, I can't really describe it. You got to watch this match. This match, they get outside the ring and they can't stop fighting. And the referee count's going on. And we're used to this in New Japan. Oh, they're going to go back before the 20 count and make it in right before the 20 count. But they were getting farther and farther away from the ring as the count was going. And I'm like, they're going to do a count out. And the referee gets up to 16. They're like back here. 17. Neither one of them were like even paying attention to even their turn around. 18. Kiyomiya goes into the chairs. Gabe Kid's not jumping on top of him. 19, and then by the time he got to 19, we re there was no way they would make it back to the ring. Double count out. And then after the double count out, they still continue to beat up each other. Gabe Kid cursing at Kiyomiya, talking about, t t talking crap about pro wrestling Noah. And I'm gonna mess you up. I'm not. And Kiyomiya is yelling stuff back at him. They then they go at each other again. Then they get broken up. Then they go at each other again. They're fighting all over the freaking arena. I'm like, wow, you gotta see this one. This was this was money. This was money. I want to see a rematch between these two because, you know, Kiyomi is not in New Japan Pro Wrestling, but him and Gabe Kidd, I, we got to see a rematch. We got to see a rematch. That was amazing. And Great Khan, who usually provides a challenge, was somewhat of a challenge to Tonga Loa here, but it was the ape that uh, got the... Uh, <laughs> I love when Rocky Romero says it. Uh, the, the finisher that I cannot pronounce on YouTube uh, for the win and uh, getting himself up there. Another another two points for Tonga Loa uh, having a good showing this year in the G1 Climax. Another match I did not expect a lot from, but they kicked it up a gear. Now, apparently these two are kind of friends behind the scenes, but uh, Hikaleu early in the match takes this kind of really nasty bump. It's like, there's a tope or a dive or whatever from Suji on him outside the ring. And he took it. And then the way he could let you turn into the string barricade, he came up clutching his collarbone, like really twitching. And even Kevin Kelly and uh, Chris Charlton, they thought he broke his collarbone because it looked really serious. I was like, Oh, what, what happened? And the, the crowd was getting into this too. Suji was trying his best to kind of counteract, and he was doing a better job at counteracting Hikaleu than anybody else has in the block so far, and being able to break Hikaleu down, but Hikaleu would come back, and Suji had a control for a lot of the match, 
that Hikaleu would, would gain control, but it felt like it was Suji's match to win. But no, Hikaleu, after several pretty damn awesome reversals, Hikaleu's best match of the tournament does get another win. Choke slam, poor Suji. Whew, poor Suji's having a hard time in the G1, but Hikaleu now is kind of uh, leveled up a little bit. So I don't know what this means for Yoda Suji. He's had some great performances, but right now he's. He's really far down in the ranking. I don't think, I'm not going to have him on my bingo card to make the playoffs. Let's put it that way. Then we get even crazier. As if Gabe Kidd and, and uh, Kiyomiya hadn't battled enough. Kenta versus El Phantasmo. These two literally battle for about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes in the crowd. They never get into the ring. They're throwing each other up and down the mezzanines. Fell Phantasmo gets busted open. He gets DDT'd on the floor. Then he gets DDT'd on the bleachers. And then Kenta's got a kendo stick. And then he's getting cracked in the head. And Phantasmo's going crazy, diving half, of, throwing himself into the air. It's there is so much insanity in this match. It's almost it's it's like the Kiyomiya Gabe Kid thing from earlier, but more athletic. Because you got Phantasmo and they were flying around all over the place. But these guys just were ripping into each other like they hated each other. Now, of course, it stems from the fact that in Bullet Club, El Phantasmo, one of his boys, along with Taiji Ishimori, was supposed to be Kenta. And then when David Finley kicked him out, Kenta then side with his buddy. They weren't really friends. so they, And Kenta's been talking some smack. So ELP wanted to take that out on Kenta tonight. And this was a fantastic performance. ELP very down in the tournament at this point in time. But they finally, finally, after a whole bunch of craziness, finally both of them get into the ring. The referee rings the bell. And within like 19 seconds, it is El Fantasmo picking up the win on Kenta. Uh, that was a great match. That was a lot of fun. Uh, ELP increasingly becoming a fan of El Fantasmo. I've been high on him for a while, but this was probably the coolest performance he had. It was a little bit of revenge, a little bit of closure to that whole story with him getting kicked out of Bullet Club. Again, I know New Japan doesn't tell stories, but that's what the story was. Sonata taking on Ren Narita. Another kind of different kind of match. The intensity that this, we're bringing it back into the ring after all these wild brawls. And these guys wrestle a really nice technical wrestling match. Sonata more and more and more and more looking very comfortable as IWGP champion, very comfortable. He, the, and I'm, I'm looking at his face. He does so much look like a throwback Japanese wrestler from a bygone era. The way he, that was just his mannerisms, his look, the way he wrestles now, the intensity, uh, it does feel old school. Of course, Ren Narita invoking, you know, the wrestlers of, of old that were just in the black trunks and the black boots. And of course, an homage to Katsuri Shibata, but trying to make his own way. Narita's had probably the hardest time. This, well, I don't know. It was, I was about to say that Narita was having the hardest time of the three Musketeers, but Yoda Suji, yeah. But I think Yoda Suji looks better coming out of his losses than Narita had coming out of his losses. And this was another case of his Sonata hit one of the nastiest deadfalls he is. I have seen him perform since he uh, adopted this as his finisher. I mean, Narita landed right on top of his head and just kind of collapsed over, and that was it. Perfect now. Sonata pretty much guaranteed. He's pretty much the first guaranteed to be heading into the playoffs at this point uh, with the amount of points that he's racked up. And in the main event, to close out this insane night, Will Ospreay, Kazuchika Okada. This is, again, this is, reminds me of very much of Kenny Omega back in... Uh, 2017 or 18, I think it was, whatever year it was, he had to beat Okada in the G1 and he had less time. They wrestle all these long matches and Osprey comes into this. He's legitimately like, look, I don't know if I, I have to beat Okada in less than 20 minutes. That's like a, a different layer to the G1. It is an interesting wrinkle though this year because it's kind of a unique thing with Okada. It's not whether or not you can beat Okada. It's it's going to be very tough to beat Okada in less than 20 minutes because you've got this even shorter time constraint. Will Ospreay gets the win here. He does get it with the Stormbreaker. This was not one of their best matches, I would say, but it definitely had that same pep, the same energy. But this match was entirely about Ospreay getting his first clean win over Kazushka Okada. Uh, now taking control. Well, not so. There's kind of a tie at the top, but he's pretty much locked into the fact now, looking at the rest of his opponents. 
Uh, you know, there's some trap matches coming up for Osprey, but it's almost a guarantee that he's going to make the playoffs at this point. Much uh, uh, an improvement across the board from the last couple of nights. As the, tour the tournament is, gets better. It seems just to get better and better and better as the nights go along. That's kind of the, the vibe this year that I'm getting from it, but that's just me. I want to know what you guys think. Let your voice be heard in the comment box below. But now let's look at the standings. And as I said, Sonata right now owning the block with 10 points. He is uh, well in the lead and will most likely be the winner of the block, as we all expected. Uh, underneath him is Shota Umino, who, like I said, he kind of came out of nowhere and has now shot up as being the runner-up. So if the tournament ended, he would have been, uh, if the tournament ends after this night, he would have been the runner-up and go on to the playoffs. Uh, Ren Narita's in at two, down at the bottom, and uh, Yoda Suchi's just above him at three. And uh, we got a little log jam at four with Hikaleu, Chase Owens, and Gabe Kidd. And, of course, Kaito Kiyomiya, because of the draw with Shota Umino, is at five. Uh, that loss, that, that was a big, big uh, loss for him. It really was with Gabe Kidd and the fact that both of them got counted out. So Kiyomiya is no longer keeping pace and is now in danger of not making the playoffs. That is going to be something definitely to keep an eye on. The B block is where we have our first official elimination. Kazuchika Okada at eight. Will Osprey at eight. And we got right behind them, Taichi. So where I said it's kind of a law jam because Taichi does have a tiebreaker over Will Osprey. Of course, if the tournament ended today, Osprey would go in. But if Taichi gets a win and Osprey loses another match, then Osprey might not make the playoffs. So Taichi's next couple matches you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, and same thing kind of goes for Okada, because Okada is not like he's got an easy pickings here. He's got Tonga Loa, who definitely could pull the upset. And we have Kenta, who also could pull an upset over Okada. It would not be out of the realm of possibility, given the history of the G1. Uh, for the rest of the block, we also have Kenta, as I mentioned, El Fantasmo getting himself back in there, Tagaloa and Yoshihashi in at four points. And the Great Okan, uh, officially no way for him now to make the playoffs. At two points, his loss to Will Ospreay kind of solidified that for him anyway. Over in the C block, at the top, we got this very interesting three-way tie for first place in the C block, David Finley, Tama Tonga, and Evil. And the reason that it is... They're all at six points. It's not a tie that is very easy to kind of sort out either because each, the way these guys, the way he's working with these guys right now, David Finley, yeah, he may have beaten Evil, but Tama Tonga beat him. And Tama Tonga may have beat David Finley, but Evil beat Tama Tonga. And Evil <laughs> beat Tama Tonga, but David Finley beat Evil. So you don't really have a clear winner. Fortunately, this is not the last night because that would be a headache to try to figure out who would <laughs> go on to the playoffs. Uh, there probably would have to be some sort of like a, a three-way match for them to play, have the playoff and whoever got pinned first would be eliminated. Uh, Eddie Kingston and Shingo Takagi waiting with four points and coming up behind that log jam at the top and at the bottom, Tomohiro Ishii, Mikey Nichols, and Aaron Hanare. Again, Hanare performing way better than his points would suggest. D block, we also have a, another elimination as Toriano. <laughs> Not a, not a surprise to anybody, but I'm surprised he hasn't won one match yet. But um, Toriano at zero points, he is officially eliminated from having any chance of going to the playoffs as if anybody expected that anyway. But uh, for not too far above him, though, is Alex Coughlin, who, like I said, he wasn't concerned about winning the G1, it seemed, but he was concerned about pinning Goto for his own personal goals along with uh, Gabe Kidd as they pursue the IWGP Tag Team Championship. Shane Haste, big win, big shocking win over Tetsuya Naito. He's at four, Naito's at four, Goto's at four, and Hiroshi Tan Tanahashi is in at four. But leading the block uh, and runner-up position right now, Zack Sabre Jr. with six points because of the loss to the man at the top right now, Jeff Cobb, eight points, leading the D block. So I have a wrap-up of the next two nights of the G1 coming up later this week, probably around uh, Monday or Tuesday. So definitely stay tuned for that. The tournament is heating up again. Like I said before, I think this has been a lot better the past couple of nights. Uh, these last three nights really made up for that kind of a stinker of night six. But we saw some amazing stuff here. If you, if you, oh, the, the last night in Odo, though, that, that, that's some stuff. You got to see for the Phantasmal match with Kenta, uh, Gabe Kid and Kiyomiya's brawl is that, that was pretty cool. 
uh, a bunch of other great matches. I've already covered them. So, yeah, I would definitely suggest you guys checking out these nights. They are definitely worth watching. But, again, I want to know what you guys thought. If you see, gotten to this point yet, are you almost there? And what do you think about the guys being eliminated already in the tournament? Let your voice be heard in the comment box below. And until next time, I will hear, see you guys here for more news, rumors, and commentary on the Rant and Review Pro Wrestling. Have a good day.